Um, yeah, a very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ninth episode of the CNET Development Dialogues. I am Anurag Reddy, a research associate at the Center for New Economic Diplomacy at the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, joining us today is a very familiar and a very special guest, uh, uh, Mr. Anil Chaudhary. Uh, Mr. Anil Chaudhary is a US tech premier uh, turned uh, a Bangladeshi gov premier who serves as the policy advisor of the uh, Bangladesh government's uh, flagship digital transformation program, A2I, uh, Access to Information, in the ICT division. Uh, and cabinet division supported by UNDP. Uh, he's been for the last 13 years leading the formation of an innovation ecosystem in Bangladesh uh, through massive capacity building, policy formulation, institutional reform, and a service innovation fund. He's, uh, you know, what we today call a technocrat, uh, serving in the in Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's uh, National Digital Task Force, the Education Minister's National ICT and Education Task Force, and uh, Mr. Chaudhary has uh, been with us in previous ORF platforms where he's spoken uh, quite a lot about uh, how Bangladesh has used has leveraged technology technology uh, during COVID. Uh, today, he's here to talk to us about the core drivers of Bangladesh's digital economy. And uh, who, I mean, uh, who better to talk to us about this today than Mr. Chaudhary. Welcome, sir. Um, and the first, I mean, the first question, uh, yeah, the first question is fairly uh, direct and simple, just to kind of set uh, context to the conversation. Uh, so Bangladesh, in a way, has truly been the economic success story of South Asia in the 21st century. And IMF now says that Bangladesh is set to overtake India in per capita GDP terms. And, you know, uh, once racked by a lot of poverty and famine in the last two decades, it's really, uh, you know, half poverty uh, has the highest uh, life expectancy rate in the country, I mean, in, in the region, and is one of the fastest growing countries in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, different factors obviously have played a role in this. Uh, I wanted to understand from you what has been the role of technology empowering Bangladesh to where it is today. If you could give us a broad overview of, uh, you know, the different tenets of Bangladesh's digital economy that would, you know, kickstart the conversation. Great. Thank you, Anurag. Uh, so technology uh, and Bangladesh. I think Bangladesh was a late entrant in the technology sphere. Uh, if you sort of roll back about uh, 12 years uh, in the 2008 timeframe, uh, with maybe less than 1% of the people using internet and uh, maybe about uh, 20 million or 25 million having access to the, uh, the mobile phones, I think that's the... the the, I would say the landscape of technology use within society. If you looked at the use of technology within government, that was even worse. Uh, we may have had about maybe 10% of the civil servants having access to a computer on their desks. Uh, maybe nobody had laptops at that time. And even with the 10% of civil servants having computers, you would see them shrouded with this uh, burqa type of thing. Okay. Because uh, they, they thought that using technology would uh, would expose some lack of uh, skills and also would uh, take away control. Uh, and some people actually felt that it was simply not needed. What would technology, when we were struggling with the, the basics of uh, food and shelter and clothing and disaster uh, relief and all of that, which is, Bangla, you know that Bangladesh is a very disaster prone country. So we were really struggling with all of that. What role would really technology play? But it was at that time, our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, just before uh, the elections, had a, had a uh, clarion call, Digital Bangladesh. This came in the December of 2008. Mm -hmm. And she said that by the 2021, uh, 2020, uh, year 2021, which is the 50th anniversary of the country's birth, will become a digital economy. So this had two very, I would say, uh, dramatic reaction, uh, two different poles. One reaction was that this is ludicrous. We were struggling with all these basics, basic necessities, putting food on the table and so on and so forth. Why would we want to talk about technology? But the, the other side of the coin was the young voters, the first time voters, whose imagination was captured that, okay, we want to become, we want to aspire to actually become a digital nation by 2021 in 13 years. So there was this two sides of the coin and which one would win out? We saw a huge number of first time voters voting for Aumi League and uh, creating a landslide victory for Sheikh Hasina and her government. 
And 2009 was really spent on um, conjecturing. So what does it mean to become digital Bangladesh? So digital Bangladesh by 2021. And there was a lot of ridicule by even the, the, the large sections of civil society media that this is, this is unachievable and this is not important. But if you fast forward now with maybe about 65% of people internet on the internet uh, from less than 1%, uh, 160 plus million mobile phone users from over 20 million at that time. Uh, service delivery uh, that has saved citizens about $8 billion in the last 10 years uh, because they don't have to go to the remote locations, the district headquarters, or even the capital city of Dhaka to access services, land records, birth registration, passports. They can go to one of the 5,000 what we call digital centers across the entire country within walking distance in most uh, locations, similar to uh, Indian panchayats. So we actually turned every uh, union location, union parishad, union council location into a digital center, which is run by uh, entrepreneurs. So there's a very unique micro entrepreneurship that has emerged. So combination of the, the government's clarion call of making the country digital, the imagination of the young people to aspire to, to that vision, to achieving that vision. And the combined work of the government and private sector really has propelled us to, to the point that we have uh, come. So it's not just an overnight thing. We have, should, have, should have toiled over the last uh, 13 years with that uh, vision and have put in place infrastructure, put in place tools to change the mindset of the bureaucracy, put in place 700 services that have become digital from analog, but we didn't really have, we may have had maybe 10 digital services at that time. Now we have 700. We still have a long way to go. We still have about another 2000 plus services to digitize, but the, the motion has been set and the foundation has been laid and the imagination of the people have been captured. So I think the combination of all of that have brought to this point where recently you saw how IMF has said that uh, Bangladesh's per capita GDP is uh, going to be slightly higher than India. Again, that's not to sit on our laurels. He just said that even five years ago, four years ago, 2016, I believe, uh, Indian per capita GDP was 40% higher than in, uh, in than Bangladesh. So to leapfrog, to catch up, and maybe even slightly surpass that is a, is a, is a remarkable achievement. Again, it's not a competition really, but it is really, we are, I would say we are competing against our past. For many years, we have not been able to progress at a reasonable clip. Uh, for the last 10 years, we've seen about uh, six plus percent growth. In the last couple of years, we've seen eight plus percent growth. For COVID, it'll be slightly smaller this year, but still it'll be fairly significant growth compared to almost every, any other nation in the world. And technology has played a huge role in terms of making service delivery accessible, making it transparent, and making the government accountable to those common citizens. Sure. Um, so, I mean, the second question, I just want to pick it up from something you just said. Uh, you said that this entire uh, effort to embrace technology has been led by all spheres of society, government, private sector, and, uh, you know, people themselves. Um, and uh, civil, the civil, Bangladesh civil society has actually been a very strong uh, uh, has been very strong and has been one of the big drivers for also the success that Bangladesh has seen. Uh, so how are communities, how are communities in Bangladesh being empowered with their own technology and data? And you know, how are they kind of leading their own digital economies and using tech and database tools to improve their own developmental outcomes? So if you could like, you know, share some stories in a specific realm or like, you know, education or health or livelihoods, you know, that would be great. Education is one area where we actually use technology quite a bit. Again, government and civil society have worked together on that. Uh, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, from within the government, it's the teachers portal, which has created the largest teachers union, I would say, within the country. So about 400,000 teachers, almost half the country's teachers are in this portal and they cooperate with each other. They share content. A lot of the content is actually coming from the rural areas. So a lot of teachers associations are working on this portal together to improve the quality of education using uh, the digital teaching learning method in, in about 40,000 plus uh, classrooms across the country, 40,000 plus schools uh, across the country. 
Uh, the civil society actually has played a big role in this. Uh, very large organizations such as BRAC, they've used uh, technology in their classrooms, in their schools. Uh, we have seen uh, 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 secondary education probably embracing technology more than primary education because we have some uh, significant infrastructure issues. We didn't have uh, electricity in many of our schools, in primary schools, uh, uh, up until maybe five years ago. Now we have electricity in almost all our schools. So that's why primary schools are now uh, fast forwarding, whereas they didn't up until five years ago. Uh, recently, a lot of uh, universities have come forward. Uh, and that actually, thanks to COVID, uh, university adoption of technology was slow uh, because every university had their autonomous uh, way of making decisions and a lot of them actually did not feel that technology would play a big role in their classrooms. But because of COVID, where everything became shut down since March, it's still shut down. Most of our, not most, all of our schools and colleges and universities are still closed. So that's when uh, uh, universities started using technology to deliver content to students over the internet. And also one, one of the things that we saw during the COVID period is that there was a significant public-private partnership. So government, private sector, and civil society driving education put a lot of content on TV. So we have a, a, a TV channel uh, that is used for parliamentary broadcasts called Parliament TV. And that is not uh, uh, fully utilized. As you know, the parliament sessions are few and far between. And uh, during COVID, we didn't have parliament sessions. So we utilized that uh, underutilized vehicle, which had full infrastructure capacity to actually broadcast content for primary, secondary, madrasa, and vocational education uh, to a large number of students uh, across the country. And that's where civil society and the government work together uh, side by side. Let me talk about it, health. Uh, health became a huge crisis, obviously. So on one hand, we had the COVID crisis. On another hand, the non-COVID patients also did not go to the clinics and the hospitals because of safety reasons. So we had to deliver healthcare services to the non-COVID patients also. So we had technology playing the role of uh, facilitator of delivering healthcare services to both COVID patients and non-COVID patients. And that's the time where we saw uh, a large number of telemedicine companies, which were small in terms of size, about 25 to 30 telemedicine companies, many of them uh, were for profit, but some of them were actually non profit companies, non profit organizations in civil society. Again, they came together uh, with the government to provide telemedicine services uh, for mental health, for COVID patients, for maternal health, for cardiology. So, many different types of services uh, for health actually were delivered using technology because we had the infrastructure. We just needed to get the practice going. Before COVID, the practice was small. With COVID, the practice was accelerated. So that's where we actually saw huge uh, uh, benefits of technology for healthcare industry. Uh, we saw a, the national, what we call the helpline called Triple Three. So anybody could call into Triple Three to get information about government services. So that basically meant that they would call in to ask about information about national ID or about land records or about passports or any other services but it was an information service. It was not to apply for services. What we saw happen during COVID is that Triple T got converted into the largest telemedicine provider of the government. And the backbone was both government and the private sector and also the civil society actually joined it. So it was a combined effort to deliver telemedicine services using Triple T. So Triple T was repurposed as the largest telemedicine provider in the country with thousands of doctors providing that service over phone and internet. Okay, sure. Um, I think um, uh, the next question is uh, slightly to look at uh, the uh, one of the drivers of a digital... <coughs> so, uh, you know, uh, some of the research that we're doing is actually trying to look at technology resilience in the Indo-Pacific region uh, with respect to the digital economies in the region. So what we kind of found is that e-commerce is usually a big driver of digital economies around the world. And I came across this very uh, interesting article on Bangladesh where uh, most of the internet commerce in Bangladesh is actually not driven on online marketplaces, but driven on Facebook. And it's called F-commerce uh, with nearly 80% uh, you know, of commerce happening there with almost 300,000 small entrepreneurs. 
so uh, you know it's and most sellers are not licensed uh, they they store inventory at home they partner with third party logistics companies and enable last mile delivery so it's it's like this you know very illustrative of the south asian concept of jugad Uh, and uh, it's also actually open doors for a lot of women right uh, nearly half of the facebook sellers are women uh, though only 15% of women have uh, mobile internet access in the country uh, and because, and usually digitization is set to uh, lead to formalization uh, but in this case uh, what do you how do you see that do you see it as the digitization of the informal economy or do you see it as the informalization of a new digital economy and what's been the government's response to such a phenomenon i mean interestingly you uh, i mean the two worlds are converging uh about 10 years ago i was listening to this uh, presentation in china where they said that the the digital devices the small devices would become big and the big device will become small and they will converge at one point so i think that's the phenomena you're talking about we are seeing convergence of different types of devices into similar format small becoming larger larger becoming smaller so whether informal is becoming formal or formal is becoming informal and that's really i mean looking at it from an economist standpoint i think uh, we can analyze that uh, there is however uh one danger of that i would say so i mean the 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 benefits that you talked about obviously uh, uh i'll talk about the benefits and i'll also talk about the danger the benefit is that the informal economy which is over 85% of bangladesh uh with digitization they'll become more and more formal so that we can provide credit scoring so that smes which don't show up in anybody's radar can become credit worthy and don't have to go to the the mahajans and the very large uh, uh tax or oh, sorry very large interest rate providers so the 30 30 35% interest rate uh providers and they don't have to go to that they can actually access 5 to 10% uh, uh credit to formal channels so those things will happen however on the other side what will happen is that a lot of them may actually get the short end of the stick because they're not ready so if we do premature digitization without developing the capacity without bringing technology to the level of many of these smes and only restrict technology to the uh, to the people who have access to technology who have the right skills then they will actually be left out so we may actually see further marginalization of many of these informal participants in the economy so i think we have to be careful so as things progress very rapidly we see f commerce booming we see 300 to 400000 f commercers many of whom half of them are women so these are great strides and great uh, successes that we can cite but if we don't bring the bottom of the pyramid up the reason i say this is that the story of digital bangladesh has been about bottom of the pyramid the 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 first intervention that we had of digital bangladesh is in the union parishads that i talked about in the union councils where we had very little internet connectivity at that time we had only 2g and we struggled but we made sure that the, we were determined to bring that level up so if we had not focused on that what we would have seen is again uh, uplifting of the already uh, successful or already uh, i guess uh, there is this uh, expression in bangla i'm trying to trying to make the translation of that in english i will probably make a poor translation so I, i won't try it basically you are uplifting the the top 10% and based creating the, the the divide to be much larger basically widening the divide so we have to focus on the bottom 10% bottom 20% to make sure that any kind of formalization or digitization that we have of the informal economy actually brings that level up and does not widen the divide i think that's that's uh, that's a very important focus that we have to have going forward just as we did uh, at the beginning of digital bangladesh in 2009 10 and 11 so um so just to uh, leading up to that from that uh, point that you said what do you think today are the challenges in uh, the digital economy of bangladesh uh, and uh, what also do you think can uh, the region learn from bangladesh's stress with uh, technology 
uh, I just uh, just uh, in the previous uh, answer that I that I gave you, I think there was one challenge I pointed out that often technologists, uh, economists, and also policymakers uh, don't focus on the bottom of the pyramid. Often we feel that trickle down will happen. So if you focus on the on the top, because they are more ready with technology, with skills, with connectivity, infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So the tendency, and because also that's where we can have a meaningful dialogue, that the technologists and the policymakers can have a meaningful dialogue with the people who are ready. And it's difficult. I remember when we had the first dialogue in 2008, eight nine timeframe about the digital centers in the rural areas, people were, people were thinking that that was such a foreign concept. I mean, I, I was reminded of Henry Ford, who said that if I asked them uh, what they would want, they would say faster horses. So when we went and talked about digital services, they said that what are digital services? How, how, how do you define it? So we had a very big struggle at that time when explaining what digital services would, would mean. But again, fast forward five, six years, everybody knew what digital services were, and there's huge demand for it. So that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. The challenge is orienting ourselves, the planners, the technologists, the policymakers, that we have to speak the language of the bottom 10, 20%, and making sure that they are propped up, they are actually uplifted with the help of technologies. That's, that's a challenge for ourselves. The next challenge that we see in Bangladesh is uh, affordability of internet. I think we have made internet uh, a lot cheaper than it, it was before, but still, uh, as we have seen during the COVID time period, we tried to pump a lot of educational content to our students over the internet. But one of the things, even at the university level and certainly at the primary school level, was the cost of internet was so high that for the marginalized, it widened the divide of digital, it widened the digital divide and hence the education divide as well. So the cost of internet, I think, is, is something that we have to work on, whether we subsidize it from the government or whether it's done through philanthropic dollars or whether we actually come up with a business proposition from the telcos, from the internet service providers in the private sector to make internet as cheap as, I wouldn't say water because water is quite expensive these days, uh, but very, very cheap so that everybody can afford it. Uh, 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 electricity has become quite cheap because we subsidize it quite, quite a bit. So if we can make uh, internet as a utility and as a right for, for all citizens, uh, many countries have already done that. So internet as a right, I think, could actually provide uh, some solution there. How we structure it, how we finance it, those are things that we have to work out. Uh, the third thing that, that I would mention as a challenge is greater level of participation of the private sector in making government services digitized. So right now there is still a, a bit of divide between how the government functions and the, how the private sector functions. I think we need a lot more public-private partnership to make sure that digitization works for the bottom uh, 10, 20% of the, of, the, of the population. So that's where we need the more creative business models, a lot more innovation uh, to make sure content and services, digital content and services are actually available, affordable and accessible uh, to the bottom 10, 20% of the, of the population. Sure. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh, and probably uh, the final set of questions that I'd like to ask you, I, uh, in your first, uh, uh, in your first uh, intervention, you actually said that, uh, you know, uh, we have this challenge where uh, most of the developing economies are still trying to, uh, you know, provide the 20, uh, 20th century infrastructure, social infrastructure, right, which is food, health, and education, uh, and all of that. Um, and, and also we have this entire dilemma where we also need to embrace technology as a big, uh, uh, you know, uh, to kind of leapfrog. So unlike the West where technologies, uh, digital technologies especially are now being used to kind of, you know, uh, uh, improve conveniences, uh, most of the developing part of the world will be using technology to actually leapfrog and uh, easily make available these uh, basic, so this basic social infrastructure. So in that sense, um, how do you envision the role of the digital economy of Bangladesh, especially in this decade, which is very crucial in the run up to the 2030 sustainable development goals? And just like finally, what do you think are the areas in the technology domain where you think 
India and Bangladesh should cooperate, whether it's for themselves or for the broader region uh, in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, India has done uh, some huge leapfrogging in recent years uh, using the other infrastructure. Uh, so that's something that Bangladesh could learn from. Again, there are some downsides of the infrastructure that we all know, how it can be used for persecution of uh, the marginalized and the downtrodden, and that's, that's definitely a danger. But uh, how the other infrastructure laid the foundation for a lot of layered services in the form of India stack, and then you have water stack and health stack that's coming together. I think that's a, that's a brilliant uh, uh, architecture design for how you set foundation and then you allow uh, different uh, departments within the government and different private sector organizations to create new services. Those could be for-profit and those could be non-profit services. So I think that's a, that's a very important uh, area for us to collaborate so how India has done it, Bangladesh has taken a slightly different approach, but it's mimicking a lot of the successes that uh, India has done. Uh, next, I'd like to talk about financial inclusion. Uh, digitization can actually make huge leaps in financial inclusion, things that we have never been able to do before. So banking at a, at a, at a, at a packet size that traditional banks are not able to do. So nano savings, nano credit, nano insurance, those kinds of things actually are possible uh, using technology because the packet size can be brought down uh, to the level of maybe uh, 10 rupees, 10 taka, that kind. And you can do any kind of transaction because the, the marginal cost of transaction becomes zero almost. I think that's an area that we need to focus on in the next five to seven years and huge successes are possible. But those successes will come from the innovations that makes sense for us. If you try to borrow the innovation from the Western countries or the Northern countries, I think we will not be able to succeed. So I think we need Southern innovations and there, I think both India and Bangladesh and many countries in this region actually have done significant innovations. I think that's where we can, we can actually learn from each other. Uh, the third area that I would say on the, on the issue of innovation is that it is really to be seen as a mindset. Right. So innovation is not about technology. It's about what is possible. It is about pushing the boundary of what is possible. So continues to continue to, we need to continue to push that boundary. And the way innovation happens, sometimes it may happen spontaneously. A person or a small group of people would just jump up one day and say, we found a solution to a large problem. But often you actually need to devise incentives in, a, in an ecosystem the right kind of incentives that could be done within the bureaucracy, that could be done within the private sector in the form of perhaps tax incentives, that could be done in the form of civil society, in the form of actually human rights, uh, if you take a rights-based based approach. So different types of incentives need to be structured depending on which lens you're looking through, which uh, eye that you have to, to solving a problem. So creating an innovation ecosystem creating the right incentives for, for making these innovations happen. Uh, and when the innovations happen, scaling these innovations up and institutionalizing them, I think will be important. So those are the areas that I think both Bangladesh and India and uh, other countries in, the, in this region can actually learn from each other because there are lots of innovations happening, many of whom are actually probably disappearing because we're not putting in the right incentive structure or, or uh, the right uh, 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 ecosystem to institutionalize them. So I think those need to be harnessed and actually made sure that they scale up and actually uh, make impact in the lives of millions. Sure. Uh, uh, and uh, one final question, and I just also wanted to add on to something you just said. Uh, and I think uh, both our countries have a huge uh, diaspora outside uh, that all that transmit and remit a lot of money back. To no, no, there's one other thing I wanted to add, if I, if I may. Uh, I probably should have mentioned. And that's in the policy innovation phase. Uh, so policy experimentation, uh, both for, uh, I think, uh, financial inclusion, we did a lot of policy experimentation using sandboxes. I think India has allowed that. Bangladesh is starting to do it. Uh, but what we need to have is a, a growing concern that, that's rising in both of these countries is uh, privacy and confidentiality issues. So what is the, the 
the Indian's uh, subcontinent version of GDPR, what should it look like? And uh, what makes sense for the, the large number of illiterate and semi-literate people in, the con in, the, in these two countries and this region? I think that's a lens that we need to look at in terms of developing the right technology policies for privacy, confidentiality, data sharing, and all of that. I think that's another area that we need to work on together. I mean, we won't get a ready solution from Denmark yeah. or from UK or from Australia. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, thanks, Mr. Chaudhary. Uh, just wanted to add on to one thing you just said, and I think I rightly agree with the fact that uh, we cannot have cookie cutter solutions from the West deployed here, and the region needs to come up with their own kind of innovations. Uh, both our countries have a huge diaspora, and I think Bangladesh recently came up with an instant sure. remittance uh, payment network with uh, Malaysia. And I, I was personally thinking that that's an area that India could definitely learn because, uh, you know, G, uh, remittance contributes to about 3% of India's, uh, uh, roughly 3% of India's uh, GDP. Um, and I uh, uh, just wanted to ask one final question. You spoke about innovation being a mindset, right? And uh, what do you, what, what is the, uh, uh, the Bangladeshi culture of innovation? I think every uh, country, every region has its own context for innovation and own cultural context. So what's the Bangladeshi flavor of innovation? Well, uh, when we launched from A2I in 2013, when we launched our first innovation fund, and there are several innovation funds in the country now, uh, in, the, in the public sector, also in the private sector, but the first one of its kind actually was launched in 2013 by the, by the finance minister. Uh, we had to define innovation. So a lot of, lot of the applicants asked, what, what would you consider as innovation? So if we propose, the first, one of the first proposals was a time machine. So whether a time machine was an innovation or not. Uh, but a uh, lot of the innovations, what we said was, would have to address three things as far as public service delivery is concerned. It, have to, it would have to reduce time, it would have to reduce cost, and it would have to reduce the number of visits. So it would have to basically reduce TCV for accessing public services. Because the first uh, innovation fund was launched, focused on public service delivery, we have to come up with a definition of innovation. And that actually has become policy now. So any innovation that reduces, or any any effort, I, I won't say any effort that reduces TCV for citizens, especially the marginal, and does not remain as just a showcase uh, in a lab. So many different types of innovations. So what we have seen is that that definition of reducing TCV really caught on and has propelled a lot of both public sector innovators and private sector innovators to come forward. We have funded about 250 innovations since then. Uh, baby incubators, very low cost baby incubators. Uh, new types of uh, nebulizer systems, centralized nebulizer during the time of COVID that was very, very important. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, new uh, technologies for education, uh, new blockchain technologies that have come together for remittances. So many different types of innovations that come together. And, <coughs> excuse me. And some innovation should deliver services that we actually do things. Just by eliminating some steps, you have brought down the concept of TCV significantly. So we've eliminated steps that have been remnants of the British colonial rule, maybe 70, 80 years ago. And we still are keeping them because our common law actually, or maybe no reform at all, we can eliminate steps. So that kind of process redesign has also redesigned or service process simplification. So that simplification of processes has also given us significant uh, innovation and uh, uh, reduction of time, cost, and visits. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chaudhary. I think uh, I honestly think that there is a lot that both our countries can learn of each other's innovation ecosystems and culture. 
And I really hope, you know, a lot of action gets translated more from the policy level down to, you know, people exchanges. Uh, I think it was really great talking to you about the different, uh, you know, tenets of Bangladesh's digital economy. And I think there's a lot more we can speak about, but uh, I think with the, uh, due to uh, the time constraint, we'll have to probably like end it here. It was really nice talking to you and thank you again for, uh, you know, coming down for another ORF uh, conversation. Thank you, Anurag, for your time and also thanks to ORF for arranging this session. Thank you very much.